How is everybody? So, <laughs> all right. Um, you know, every time we get to get together again, I'm, I'm thankful uh, that, we, that we can do this and grateful that we get to gather here and uh, um, study God's Word this evening. Um, there'll also be those that get to watch this on, on video, and, um, and this will be watched by many other people. So could we, could we give those who will watch this on video a, a hand clap as well, let them know that they're, they're, they're welcome. So let's, let's start off with a word of prayer, and then we will get into uh, the, the evening. Father, just so grateful that we can gather like this, and that we can study your word, and, and just uh, take a moment and reflect upon your son. And, and Lord, my prayer over the next several weeks is that you would help us all to have a better understanding of how to read Scripture so that ultimately as we read Scripture, we will find and we will see your Son. We know that Jesus said that the entire Old Testament was about Him. And, and Lord, I, I know that oftentimes as we read Scripture, when we read the Old Testament or we read the New Testament, Sometimes it's hard to understand what's going on and why certain words are the way that they are and why phrases are the way that they are. And, and, I, and I just pray that um, because I know you love your people, you love your church, um, I, I just pray that those that are here and those that watch via video, um, I, I pray that this would be an incredible resource for all of those that will watch this and are those that are here with us. Um, I, I pray that over the next several weeks that the ability to possibly start to seeing Scripture through a different light, being able to see things that maybe they had never seen before, um, Lord, that you would do like you did with the Emmaus disciples, that you would open our eyes and we would truly see you for who you are. And so I, look, I just ask, Lord, that you would bless this time, this evening, and in the, in the subsequent weeks that we will gather and uh, um, we're going to be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And everybody said, amen, amen. So we, we want to sort of wade into this. Um, we, we, we decided that we we're going to do seven weeks. And, and then what we're going to do is we, we, we need to take a, a break for maybe a week or two. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we're going to do a Q&A after you've got some time to really think through what we've done. So write those questions down as we go through this. Um, and, and, the, and the goal here, obviously, is to, is to help everybody to be equipped to, to read Scripture better. So I want, I want to set this up um, in, in, a, in a way that, that hopefully um, makes sense and why we're doing this and, and what the intended outcomes are. F first of all, every session that you come, you're going to get a handout at the end of the session. This particular handout is eight pages. Um, it is much more in depth than what we will try to do um, over the next hour. Um, and so this will be like homework. It'll also be something that you can reflect on for the week. And then we'll come back the following week and we'll do another one. And so we're going to do this for seven weeks. Um, I would highly suggest um, that you make a commitment. And we did this, we abbreviated this rather than making it like a unending you know, time, we, we, we decided that if we did this for seven weeks, that that's something people can commit to. Um, and, and so we're hoping that over the next seven weeks that you'll be blessed and this will, uh, will, will speak to you. And the reason I wanted to do this is uh, when, when I, I met Warren when I started to do my doctorate of ministry at Knox, and, you know, I came to Knox already with a a doctorate. I mean, I knew theology well, but what Warren did is Warren fundamentally changed the way I, I looked at Scripture, um, and, and I'm I'm grateful for that. I mean, just just grateful for, for the for the time and the um, pouring into me that you that you have done. Um, and and what I want to do is I want to help because many of you say to me, and I've heard this over many years, you know man, you always find something in Scripture that, I mean, I've read that passage for a long time and never seen it. What I want to do is I, 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 don't, I don't want that to be something that you just have to wait every Sunday or you know, every once in a while to get. I, I, we want to equip you to be able to 
to, to, to see Scripture that, that way. And I, I remember when we first started meeting, I had all kinds of questions because I was like, hold on, this is not, this is not the way I was taught to read Scripture. This, is, this, this doesn't fit my, my mold. And, uh, um, you know, we, we would argue and banter and, and go back and forth. But over, over time, I, I started realizing, wow, there is a whole nother way to, to look at this. And I think we would both agree that the early apostles, I mean, even Jesus himself, that's the way they read Scripture. You know, and uh, so th- that's what we want to do. And I don't want to oversell something but that, that is the goal, is to be able to take some elements out of the life of Christ that most of us know um, and to, to look at those and, and to read them and, and to start seeing that, hey, every word matters and, and, and to also understand that the, the biblical writers, that we have what's called high communication and low communication. Um, you know, high communication is the type of communication where if you're in a group and everybody knows what's going on, you, you may just have to say the Denver trip and everybody knows what that means. Um, that if you have to explain the Denver trip to everybody and where you went and what you did, that's low communication. The Bible is written to people in a high communication way where the people who are reading this already know a lot about the world that they're living in that they would just know when words and phrases were, were said that they would know how to take those and understand those. And oftentimes it's a little lost to you and me because we come to scripture oftentimes through low communication and we got to learn how to get to that high communication. And so th- th- that being said, I, uh, I, I, I really am excited and, and I uh, um, am grateful that Warren has come up. Warren, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for making the trip from Fort Lauderdale. Um, you mean a lot to me and I hope that the people of Grace will welcome Warren for being here and you know, being a part of being a part of our church. Warren's also a board member um, of our church, and he does watch pretty much every sermon. <laughs> I, I get every every Saturday night at uh, about five forty five five fifty. I get a text that says the doctrinal police has now tuned in <laughs> to watch your sermon. So, uh, um, <laughs> or something like that. Something. And uh, so, but. Uh, Glad you're here, and you know, so as we journey into this life of Christ, and we are going to take um, communion at the end, and, and I would just say if you're watching via video, this would be a good time to maybe press pause, and you could get the elements ready, and then, and then resume to, uh, to come back at the end and, and, and be ready for communion. But we decided to take the life of Christ, and we, we're probably starting in a way that people would go, why would they start there? Uh, most people probably would think we would start at like the pre-birth announcement or maybe the birth of Jesus, but we have decided that we want to start the class off um, at the Last Supper, and I think that begs the question, and I think probably people would be, why are they starting there? So maybe you can help us out. Why are we starting with the Last Supper? I uh, would like to take just a second to say how much it's been a joy to watch God's blessing on this work. When I met Chip, there were 80 people at Grace. And to see the amazing uh, movement of the Spirit of God is just, it's really exciting and encouraging. And I will tell you, uh, Chip spoke so graciously and kindly about me, but uh, I had a, we had a very difficult curriculum. It typically took two years to do. Your pastor was the number one fastest uh, in in comprehending that that curriculum, he went through the whole thing in nine months, which was unbelievable. He's got a very very quick mind, and we we hit it off pretty much early on. We did. He likes to banter, and I like to tease, so we it works out really well, I think. And he teases back. Let me tell you, sometimes he can be pretty withering. So. But uh, we've got, it's, been, it's been a delight to see how God, I knew, I could see the talent and, the, and especially the heart for the people of God in Chip. So I know that wonderful things are ahead for grace. Now, about where we're starting, we decided to do the life of Christ, and I did not want to start with the nativity. Almost everybody that does the life of Christ begins with the birth in Bethlehem, and goes through to the resurrection. I wanted to break that pattern because Jesus does not begin in Bethlehem. 
His humanity, the incarnation, begins in Bethlehem. But Jesus, John tells us, was the, the word of God, the ten words that God spoke in Genesis 1 by which he created the world. So all things were created by him. He is a major character in the Old Testament. He appears, uh, in the Old Testament, he appears to Jacob. He's the one who wrestled with Jacob in the nighttime. He is the God-man, as Moses tells us, who wrestled with Jacob. He is the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Moses, Moses, and he is the one who said, I am. And then he announces these I am's, the seven I am's in, in the Gospel of John. He is a major character in the Old Testament because he is divine as well as human. And so in his divinity, he is uncreated. He has always been. In the beginning, he was with the Father and has been since before he created time and space. And so his, his person is immense, and we want to come to know him. You are all of you being prepared to be his eternal companion. And so you want to know who he is, and he is far greater than just his humanity. His humanity is unbelievable. And we'll be speaking about that. But he, he, the word who was God in the beginning became flesh in Bethlehem in the womb of Mary, and he enters into the world through the birth canal of a Jewish maiden. These are mysteries of our faith. They're phenomenal mysteries. We want to give some thought to that. This week, we look at the mysteries of the Last Supper, where he begins his work of redemption, and then next week, we will look at the mysteries of the cross, and in the week after that, we'll look at the mysteries of the resurrection. So I want to begin with where it all comes together because everything then feeds into that and, and we'll be able to understand and comprehend his ministry, I think, so much better. Now, beginning with the Last Supper, um, I want to take a look at that picture. Uh, yeah, let's let's, let's, let's flip the, it up uh, here. There. You got it right there. This is da Vinci's picture. I think it's probably the greatest painting ever written. If you've read anything about it or studied it, it's phenomenal. What he did, did in this is amazing. But if you look at this picture, da Vinci painted it it's for a eating. It's a mess hall in a monastery, and he wanted them to think about the Last Supper at every meal. And so he painted this picture, and in the, the dramatic moment of the picture is Jesus has just announced, one of you will betray me. And knowing that, you can look at the posture of the disciples. You see Philip the third from his uh, left pointing like this, is it I? And all of them, remember, were, is, Lord, is it me? They just went down the road that way. You see them gesturing. What, is, what does he mean? What, what, what does that mean? One of you will betray me. Now, Jesus knew precisely who the betrayer was. He gave the sign of the sop. Remember, he revealed to John and to Peter that it was Judas, and he told him, what you do, do quickly. He's, he's telling him to leave so that he's not there for the supper. He's taking, he, he tells him to, to leave, go about his business. And so why did, why did the Lord, the question I want to raise is, why did the Lord, knowing who the traitor was, phrase it in a way that everybody would be introspective? Lord, is it I? And that would, that insecurity of faith would be expressed by all the 11 who were innocent. See, that's a, that's a good point, though. Like, and I want to jump in because I think this is important. You probably have read the passage, or at least you're familiar with the passage. And you, you probably, and not negative, but probably never thought, like looking at this picture where everybody's like, who is it? Whatever. Probably never read it with that thought process of, what would it have been like to be at the table and everybody? Like, why did Jesus raise that question? You know, why did he say that? Because that set everybody at the table off. You know, is it going to be me? Is it me? Is it you? Is it, is it someone else? And when we read Scripture, it's so important that we try to take in the moment because, you know, the the obviously the disciples and people who read that, they were aware of the supper. And, you know, I mean, we're, as we'll talk a little bit later, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting because the first writing about the Lord's Supper is not the Gospels. It's Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. But it, just think about that for a minute. When you're reading the text, 
Jesus asks, you know, says the thing, somebody's going to betray me, and everybody there has to take a moment to sort of go, who is it? Is it me? And this picture really depicts that, but I can tell you that it's really easy to read Scripture and miss just those subtle things, but it's powerful because you're going you're gonna to talk about the power of that, but I just I want to make sure that everybody pauses for a moment. When you're reading Scripture, there's not one word, there's not one action, there's not one story that's just sort of surplus in there. Every word, every phrase has just pregnant meaning. And so as we continue to expound on that, I just want to make sure that, because I, I know I've, pray, I've I've read that story many times and never thought about what it would have been like to be at the table mm -hmm. questioning. I think that oftentimes it's asking the right question. That's the key. And this question is profoundly significant. When Paul wrote about the communion, the, the Eucharist, the Last Supper that we, the Memorial Supper that we take, he gave directions about how it should be implemented in the church there in Corinth, which of course apply to us as well. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, after he tells us the order that Christ gave first the bread, then the, then the wine, and describing all of that, he says, so before you come to this table, let every man examine himself. And I think he's taking that, and the, the examination is, am I worthy to partake of these elements? And he says it's significant. He says, because many have, have, have uh, falsely partaken of this table without that examination. He says, many of you are sick, and some have died, or some, have, some are sick, and many have died. So here is, here is food that God is appointing for us to partake in, but the penalty for doing it unworthily is death. It's like it's back in the Garden of Eden. Of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of this tree, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So there's, there's a connection with Genesis. God has appointed this table for us to partake of it, but we must do it in a worthy manner. Paul says you've got to partake of it worthily, and he wants us to examine ourselves before we go into communion. So that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about that. What does that mean? I'm, I'm going to talk about that at the end. What does it mean to examine ourselves? And how do we know that we're worthy to partake of that cup and of that bread? We'll t I'll talk about, I'm coming back to that. But I want to talk first about the significance of the supper. Um, Just but before mm -hmm. we get to the supper itself, though, um, it's, it's imperative that we get the picture because this is part of learning to read Scripture, is that Jesus set up the examination. He did, with you know, his it, 11. With, with the question, I mean, it, it, as we were talking, I mean, you, you could, it's not, but you, know, it's, you could go, wow, that was, that was a little bit harsh to put everybody under that mm -hmm. moment of, is it me, is it you? you know, but he set that up. There, there was a questioning there at that supper, and, and, and we'll pick up on that later, but mm -hmm. that's a that's super and Paul important. makes that normative. That's for exactly us. right. So we must examine ourselves, and the consequences are severe they are. if we if we do not. So I want to talk about what does that mean, so that when we partake of it this evening, uh, we will know that we are partaking of it in a worthy manner. So we'll come back to that. Now, we, I said I wanted to begin with the Last Supper because this is where the Lord begins to reverse the work of the devil. The very central verse of 1 John, the evangelist who writes the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, he writes Revelation, and the three general epistles, and the, one of them, the first one, 1 John. The very center of it, John says, for this reason Jesus came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil. And it's at the supper that he begins to undo, to reverse the, the work of the enemy who has caused such grief to the human family, and that God would send another man, uh, his own son, in order to reverse, and we're going to see that, what he's doing in the cross, what he's doing in the resurrection. He's reversing all of the judgments and all of the sin of the Old Testament. Here he begins that work of reversal. 
If we understand the Last Supper, the cross and the resurrection, everything else that happens in his life, everything else that's recorded in the Bible will make immense sense to us. So we're looking at the answer, really, key can you, to the can whole you, uh, thing. Can you expound a little bit um, on the centrality of a book? Because the, the writers know their geography. Because John mm-hmm. doesn't just do it in First John. He also does it in John and in Revelation, in the center of each of those books. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, just, that's the centerpiece a, of John's thinking about God is Christ being lifted up and Satan being cast down. So the center of First John, for this reason Christ came into the world, in order that he might destroy the works of the devil, the very center of the gospel, of the literary center of John, between the two foot-washing narratives, is the triumphal entry. And at the triumphal entry, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and there is thunder and voices, angel voices, that are heard from heaven. And Christ says, now is the, the ruler. ruler of this world, the, the Satan, is being cast out of heaven. So he sees that. That's the, the center of the gospel. The literary center, the very center, the literary center of uh, Revelation is the war in heaven that begins with thunder and the angel voices and Satan. There's no room, no place found for him in heaven and he's cast down to earth. So there's an axis between the two great books of John that's talking about the same thing. That is, the enemy is brought down and Christ is going to be exalted through the cross. He's lifted up on the cross but then he will be raised in resurrection, ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father. So those are the the primary directions by which we come to understand how all this works. Well, now at the supper, um, Jesus is very deliberate. The enemy brought ruin to the human race as as a sacrament by eating. We were told not to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And the way that the fall of man, mankind, is described by Moses in Genesis 3 is by the temptation that came to the woman. And the enemy appeared in masquerade. He came as the serpent speaking. And he said, uh, and he, he engaged in dialogue with Eve to deceive her. And then it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was a delight to the eyes, desirable to, and, and uh, good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit. That's the beginning of the fall. She took of its fruit that was forbidden and ate and then gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So these three verbs describe the ruin that came into the human family and the rivers of tears and blood that have flowed from that disobedience are unbelievable. The plagues, the violence, the oppression, all of the tragedy of the human condition uh, came from that one simple act of disobedience. And it's actually described by Moses with three simple verbs. She took, she ate, and she gave. So at the table, Jesus, and it says then, then their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked. That was the consequence of the fall. So the Lord begins to undo the works of the devil at the table. And he says to the disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body, take and eat. And he gave it to them. So he takes the three verbs that described our fall and makes them the three verbs that begin our restoration. It's magnificent what he is doing. When we partake of this sacred supper, we are with him at his behest, at his command. He says, take, eat, and he gives it to us. When he does that, he is, we are reversing. We are expressing our faith that Jesus is reversing the work of the devil. And the evangelists are very strategic when they describe his suffering and his resurrection, the cross and the open tomb. They flank that redemptive work of Jesus with two suppers, the Last Supper, and then after the resurrection, in the afternoon of the resurrection, the supper with the disciples at Emmaus, and where he is explaining the Old Testament and that paradigm of suffering and glory that that opens up the Old Testament to his disciples, and they press on him to come and have supper with them, the evening of the resurrection. 
And they, he, has, he has hidden himself. He's masqueraded himself. They don't recognize who he is until he takes the bread and breaks it. My suspicion is they saw the scars because the text says, Luke writes, and their eyes were opened and they knew him. And so that's the, the, the turnkey. At the supper, take, he says, take, eat, and give. So he's reversing the, the fall. And at the uh, supper at Emmaus, their eyes are opened, but instead of their nakedness and shame, they see him. And Paul says that Jesus is the covering for our sin. So the drama of the supper is that is the beginning of our uh, restoration. And um, I want to talk a little quickly about the, the elements, yes. too. Um, it, and this is important. So when you're reading the text, you know, and again, like just the take, the eat, give, eyes are open, you, you, you start to see those parallels. And, and we'll build on this over the next seven weeks. Like I said, we want to sort of wade into this. But the elements at the supper are the bread and the wine. And as a general rule, and it's no fault of, of any of us, um, we, don't, we don't live in that world and we don't have the, we don't see the making of the bread on a regular basis. We don't see the making of wine on a regular basis, but they did. And those elements, the elements themselves are incredibly providential. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go through that. Um, and uh, I, think, I think you're going to be blessed. So let, let's start with the bread. Let, let's talk about what's going on with the bread and how it's made. Um, and I, I think you'll be blown away when you, when you realize, had you lived in the ancient Near East, you, you, these would have been things that you knew daily and experienced daily. But the providential nature of God on the way that this bread is made and the wine is made is absolutely incredible. So tell us about the bread. Some years ago, I asked a class, I said, where does bread come from? And they said, well, Publix. And it's all wrapped in cellophane and sliced nicely. And I think, I think that that's the culture we live in, and we forget we... Bread and wine do not come forth from the earth. The elements come forth, but they have a manufacture. And that manufacture is what gives us the bread and the wine. And there's much instruction in that. Chip was just saying that they lived, I mean, that's, they had to make their bread, they had to make their wine. So let me, let me talk about this, because the processes of making the bread and the wine all the way through the Bible become emblems of torture. And there's a significance to that. So Jesus says the grain of wheat falls into the earth to die, but then it comes forth abundantly as the Lord of the harvest gives the increase. And that process of planting the seed that itself dies, but then comes forth abundantly, is showing the, the death and the burial, and then the resurrection glory, the abundance of the resurrection. When Jesus says that in John 12, 24, he's anticipating what I'm about to share. But when the, when the, when the wheat field is planted, and many of you, have, I'm sure, have seen this. We talk about, we sing about amber waves of grain. The wheat fields are beautiful in the wind. God sends the sun and the rain, and they come forth, and they're just beautiful. And um, the way the wind hits it, and it's just, it's just lovely. But then the reaper comes. The reaper is always an emblem of death. And the scythe that beheads these stalks of grain and so the uh, stalks of wheat are cut down by the scythe of the reaper, which is an emblem of death. But then the grain is embedded in the stalk, and so it has to be thrashed. And thrashed is another of your words. It has to be beaten in order to separate the grain from the chaff. Then it has to be winnowed, and the winnowed is the sifting. It's the judgment. It's used as an emblem of judgment. The winds blow away the chaff and leave the, the grain itself. But they take the grain and it's crushed under a millstone to make the flour, isn't it? And the flour is made into dough and then in the process of it, it's kneaded with fists, actually, that express the violence of the kneading uh, of, the, of the dough. 
Then the, then the dough is rolled out, it is striped, it is pierced, and baked in the oven. And through all of these pictures of biblical judgment, that is the process by, we, by which we receive the bread of life. And I think that that's not insignificant. Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. And when he said that, he's not just comparing himself to that which gives us life, but we should hear in that that he has to go through all of these tortures for us. He went through all of that process-making in order that he had to fall into the earth and die, in order that we would have abundance of life and look at us. I mean, we, it's, it's amazing how he has, has done all of that. And similar to that, after the bread, he took the cup, and the grape seed, once again, has to fall into the earth and die. But then the vine comes up, and these clusters, these beautiful clusters of grapes, God sends the rain and sends the sun, and these grape clusters that are just so beautiful swell out in the, um, in, in, in the natural order of things. But then the harvesters come, and they cut off these clusters of the vine, and they want to make the wine, so they have to gather them. But the way you make wine requires human agency. They would have women uh, tread the wine. And so they're, they're literally treading on these grapes, which breaks the skin and the, 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 um, the, the blood of the wine uh, comes forth. The reason that a woman has, it was a woman, not a man, typically, because the seed, you don't want to crush the seed or it will embitter the wine. So that, that uh, force of the, of the, particularly the female body, would crush the, the, the grapes, but it was not heavy enough, typically, to crush the seed, which you don't want. When a man did it, it would often embitter the wine. Jesus, by the way, makes wine twice. He makes the wine at Cana, as you know, but he also treads out the winepress of the wrath of God, and that's spoken of in Revelation 19. So, uh, Anyway, the, the, the grapes bleed forth the juice that is collected in vats and placed in skins. Isn't that interesting? They had skin vats back in those days. So the juice ferments into wine, and the wine is poured forth through all of these tortures. And the bread gives us life, the wine in the Bible is God's gift of joy to the community. So Jesus, who is the bread come down from heaven, also says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Let's talk about that for a minute. How, how, you don't have to raise your hand. You probably have never thought about bread and wine that way. But see, this is the beauty of Scripture. The, the fact that he chose bread and that he chose wine was not just happenstance. Every word, every passage has meaning, and it's slowing down, it's, it's taking that time, it's, it's realizing the literary devices, the word play, all of the stuff that really helps us to, to understand the things that are that are going on. I mean, this is, none of this is coincidence. And if, if this evening, if we can do nothing more than to get you to go, wow, th there's a lot here, th then we have accomplished what we want to accomplish this evening, which is to get you thinking that way, because over the next many weeks, we will continue to drill into this, and you'll start to realize, wow, there's, there's a whole other way to look at Scripture. It's not just reading the text and devotionally reading, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're, we're, we're happy when anybody reads the Bible, but I think there is a, a way to connect to Scripture in a way where it's, it's so beautiful because it's just, it all relates back to Jesus, you know? Obviously, the Creator intended all of this, and it is an intention. The manufacture of the bread and the wine is intentional to display something about the Savior. I think that it's significant that we see this because if I, if, I, if I add these together, he was going to die, so they cut him down. He was thrashed, he was winnowed, he was crushed, he was kneaded, rolled out, striped, pierced, and baked. All of that is the expression of his love for you. Let's not miss that. 
it's wonderful to see what's intended in the text, but to imagine that he would go through all of that in order that he can say to you, this is the bread of life. And he will say to you, take and eat freely. And we derive our life from him and that personal understanding. The reason it's significant to understand it in terms of the culture and, and literature, but it's also, don't miss the point that he willingly went through all of this. He was like the, the grape that had to be trodden underfoot and mistreated and, and crushed in order to bleed forth that which becomes for us the wine of joy. He doesn't partake of the wine, remember? I don't think he partook of any of the supper. He is the paschal lamb. He is, he, is, he is the bread of life. He is the wine. All of it speaks to him. And he did that for us. He knew hunger that we might be full. And so I think if we, if we keep that in mind, um, it becomes much more personal and really in many ways much more beautiful, I think, to us. And you have a personal story about the drama of the supper, all of the things that are going on in that questioning, the examining, is it me? Um, and and I, I think that would be awesome for you to share, you know, as, as we, because we do want to go to the Lord's table this evening. We, would you share some of that? And I think you have a passage that you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah. Just share it. Let me, let, me, uh, let me tell you how I prepare my heart because we have to partake, as I said at the beginning, in a worthy manner. Paul says that. We don't partake in an unworthy manner. It's what he, it's anoxios. Oxios is worthy. Anoxios is the unworthy. We don't dare come to this table in an unworthy manner. And so what does it mean? How do we prepare our heart? What does it mean to partake in a worthy manner? Now, why did the Lord plunge these 11 innocent disciples into that self-examination, and then Paul derived from that, that method that Jesus used, he derived that we should then examine our hearts before we come to the sacred supper. How do we, how do we prepare our hearts? And I want to share with you what the Lord has, has shown me. I come from a faith tradition that actually makes this a part of communion. When we have communion, uh, we do what we call fencing the table. I don't like that term, but I understand it. By fencing, we warn people, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 11, don't come to this table unless you truly know and are trusting in Jesus with all your heart. It's a table for Christians. We invite everyone to come, but we want to warn them if the consequences are sickness and death, we want to warn them. You do not come to this table cavalierly or casually. You prepare yourself. For this. And so, and that's that preparation, Paul says, would result in our being able to partake of this sacred table in a worthy manner. What, is that, what does that mean? Worthy is a high bar. Mm -hmm. who, is, who is worthy for these things, Paul will say. Um, so I want to, I what does that mean, and how do we know that we are partaking of this in a, in a worthy manner? And I want to share something uh, out of my personal experience with this. Um, I was brought to faith early at five by a godly Christian mother. Uh, my father was not a Christian, and of course, as a son, he was my main influence. But my mother um, prayed for me and took me to church regularly. I had Sunday school teachers that really built into me. I mean, I, I remember them with great gratitude honestly. Your, your mom prayed something specifically for you. Yeah, she did. We were did. talking about that on the phone. That's yeah, good. Share that. She did. My, uh, my mother um, prayed. I'm the only child, only son. She prayed when she found out she was pregnant, and she didn't, she was told she wouldn't likely have children, but anyway, when she found out she was pregnant, she prayed that God would make me a Bible teacher, <laughs> and that... <laughs> I look back at my life and I think, my goodness, what a circuitous way of doing it. I, but that's, I, you know, if you're a parent, pray for your kids. God yes, answers those yes. prayers. I mean, in, 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 she went out and... Went my, out. When my grandfather died about a year before I was born, 
he had a little coin purse, and he had a dollar and a 50 cent piece in that coin purse. And so she gave instructions on the day I was born to her very best friend to take and to buy me a Bible. That was the first possession that I had in this life. And so her friend very faithfully, on the day I was born, it was a Friday, she went out and bought a Bible. The Bible was one dollar. <laughs> it was leather bound, and that was the first Bible I ever read, but that, that tells you something. So um, it, wasn't, awesome a, though, it wasn't a Confederate it's, dollar, it was a, an actual <laughs> federal note. But, anyway, it was, uh, um, but, but it's awesome though that, I mean, your mom prayed for you to be a Bible teacher. I mean, goodness gracious, that just, it shows you that, you know. Uh, it, yeah, I had, a, I had a wonderful mom. And so she led me to faith uh, and my, my Sunday school teachers. And so anyway, I was about, um, I think, I kept trying to, I don't know what age, it was around 15, 16. Uh, I started, I, I grew up in a neighborhood church where everybody was poor. We were all poor. We didn't know how poor we were. <laughs> this was the 60s. But we were all poor. And uh, but I started going, I, I was really attracted by the ministry of Dr. W.A. Criswell, and it was Dallas, Texas. And so I started going to First Baptist. That was my uh, tradition I was raised in. And um, I absolutely loved that man. I was attracted to, he was a scholar, the way that he spoke about the Bible. I just, I, I, I thought he, I, I really grew to love him, and he became my mentor in ministry. Magnificent sanctuary. I mean, this is where all of the property, the, the property itself, oak pews, carved oak with velvet cushions. I'd never seen anything like that. I had no idea. They had these stained glass windows. It's just absolutely, stunningly beautiful sanctuary. And everybody came in, was dressed to the nines. This is where all of the, the glitterati, the, you know, the intelligentsia of Dallas went to this church. Largest church in the world at the time, 27,000 members. So you've got a, you've got a ways to go, Chip. But, but uh, yeah, and well, that was in the. We're not going to have carved days. pews with uh, velvet seats. So <laughs> I, I think hate those to, days are gone. I, I know that that bothers you, but you know. We, that, yeah, I would. We, we're I, not going to roll that deep. I'll tell you that sanctuary was just magnificently beautiful, and uh, at a balcony and the choirs with all with raw. It was just. It was a spectacle for somebody who didn't come from that kind of a background. And so when they, when they did the communion, pastor would sit up at the, top, at the front and have a long table because they had to serve thousands of people in the, in the balcony round in the sanctuary. And all the silver settings, remember the silver play at platters and then those where they'd have the, the, yep. the grape juice. This mm -hmm. is Baptist, right? So anyway, they'd have all of those, those uh, services up we there. We do grape juice too. Part, yeah, sure, absolutely. I, I, I understand why we do that. But anyway, um, it was just a magnificent setting, and the lights uh, would shine, and he, he made, it, made it a spectacle. He'd take a, a loaf of matzah bread, and he, he would wipe his hands with a cloth, and then he would break it. On the night he was betrayed, he would quote 1 Corinthians 11, and the ceremony, the spectacle, was just amazing. And I realized how sacred this was. And um, anyway, I was going there. And I knew I didn't fit in somehow, because these people were very different from me. But I couldn't keep away. I was there whenever the doors would open, because I loved this man and his ministry. And uh, anyway, but I felt like I knew that you had to partake of the table worthily. I think they probably even mentioned that, Pastor did. And I felt so out of place. I'm only 15, 16. And I'd been raised right by God's grace. I wasn't falling into a lot of open and notorious kind of sin. But I knew my, my thoughts, I knew my heart, and I was just, I really felt out of place. And so, when they would have this sacred ceremony, it was beautiful. I, couldn't, I could not not go and miss it. But I would sit in the back of this large sanctuary so that when the elements got close by, I could slip out because I thought, there's no way I can be worthy to partake of this table. And it wasn't just that it was, you know, the wealth and the opulence of Dallas. It was that I felt like I'm not... I'm not worthy to 
partake of that. I mean, I know my heart, I know my, my wickedness, and I'm not worthy. So, what, so that went on for about six months where I would, I would go to the supper, but I would slip out in order to not be particularly noticed sitting in the back that, that I wasn't taking. I didn't want to, there were a number of factors psychologically that were feeding into that. I just didn't feel like it was, I was worthy. And so it was about six months later that a friend suggested to me what worthiness is. And I want to share with you what worthiness is. What does it mean? How do we know? How is any of us worthy to partake of this table that represents the suffering, the innocent suffering of our Savior? Um, who, is, who is worthy for these things? Who can possibly be worthy for these things? And so, I want to read a passage out of Revelation that talks about worthiness. And this will be our period. If we're going to partake of communion together, we can, we can really focus in on that, to know that if we are partaking of this, we are doing it in a worthy manner and what that means. And it's John's vision in chapter 5 where he sees into the heavenly courts. And this is the vision that he saw. He saw the great judgment day. And in the right hand of him who sat on the throne was a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now, you've got to understand that in John's way of thinking, the Lord is the Word of God. So the emblem, the picture of Jesus is a scroll. He is that scroll. And it has seven seals. And who is worthy to open those seven seals? The seals of the scroll are his seven wounds on the cross that are opened one by one. It begins with the crown of thorns that pierces his skin and draws forth the first blood. Then there is the scourged back, the two hands and the two feet that are pierced with nails. And then finally, the piercing in the side that draws forth the water and the blood. Only he is worthy to give his life as the redemption price for mankind, for us. And that's what it means to open the scroll. Who's willing to do that? Who's worthy to do that? Jesus is the only one who is worthy to do that. Is he willing to do that? And that's what he wrestles with at Gethsemane. And he's already resolved to drink that cup. He drinks the cup of bitterness that we might drink the cup of joy. So keep that in mind when we do this. It's an expression of his love for us. He's, this is his body that is going to be broken and pierced in order that we can be made whole. So um, I heard a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or the earth or under the earth was able, was worthy to open the scroll and to look into it. No one can die for another man's sin because we are sinners ourselves. So I wept much, John says. That's the response of the heart of faith. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And that's us, that's me, that's you. We are not worthy. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. He will offer himself that that scroll of the book of his word might be given. He's the only one who can save us. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the Four living creatures stood in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. He is a wounded lamb. Do you remember in the great battle that set out in Genesis 3.15? Uh, the seed of the woman would come, the hero who had crushed the head of the serpent. But as his foot is coming down to crush the head of the serpent, the serpent strikes his heel. So he will take a wounding himself. 
He will be wounded. He will take the wounds that really were my wounds. So anyway, he is, it's a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He knows all of our sin, and he loved us anyway. He gave himself for us. He knows all our sin. He knows every sin, not, that, not only that we have committed, but we will commit in future. None of us knows what the future has. David certainly didn't before he had that fatal walk on the roof and saw Bathsheba and then sinned the sin that destroyed the kingdom. None of us knows what the future holds, but we know this. Jesus has come back from death, and he says, I am the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning and the end of your life. And then what does he say? Fear not. He makes a full atonement for everything that we've done, are doing, and will yet do. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He doesn't come as a supplicant. He comes as a co-regent, takes the scroll. That's bold, my goodness. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. This is an overwhelming spectacle that John saw. And John is weeping because he knows he's not worthy, you see. But he's been told, don't weep. There is a Savior. And he said, and they sang a new song, saying, a new song, the word new is really not temporal, it's redemptive. It's, uh, we have a new covenant, we are given a new heart, we partake of a new wine, we look for a new heavens, a new earth. All of those are the redemptive promises that we have, and now we have a new song. And this is what they sing to the lamb, the wounded lamb that was as if he were slain. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. If that's the song of your heart, you can come freely and worthily and partake. You recognize we're not worthy, but he is worthy. And he invites us to come, and on that basis, when I was a teenager, I realized he has told me to come this is my body, take and eat. This is my blood of the New Testament. Drink it, all of you. The command is to come and to partake, but to recognize. The, the examination is to see, I am not worthy, but he is worthy. If you understand that, you are made competent, you're made worthy. So, um, out of every tongue and tribe and people and nation, you have redeemed us to God by your blood and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And they are singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, because he is worthy. He alone is worthy. And on that basis, then, we invite you to come with us as we start this journey through the life of Christ. And by God's grace, uh, we will end it at the supper too, because the story that I have omitted that precedes this is the Savior of the world kneeling down to wash the feet of his disciples. And we will come to that story. We will know the life of Jesus. So as we prepare our hearts, Chip will lead us in this sacred supper. I'd like to read uh, 1 Corinthians. I normally just recite it, but tonight I want to I read it. I think it's interesting that the Gospels are written after 1 Corinthians. So the first story we get of the Lord's table is from Paul, which is interesting. And this is what Paul says. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it. When he blessed it, he broke it. I always, I don't always say it, but I often say it when we do take communion together as a church. And I believe this, that the things that the Lord blesses, he breaks. And it's, it's in that breaking that we understand who he is. But he takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it. And he says, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You can see how Paul, who knows the tradition that Jesus at that supper said, one of you will betray me. And it sent that table into a drama of introspection. Paul has drawn on that. Let a man examine himself. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, Wait for one another, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. I think that as we start this series, we, uh, we obviously wanted to take a moment and come to the table of the Lord. And uh, if you would, let's get the elements prepared. Um, you can get the, uh, the, the top of the bread ready. And uh, as the Lord said on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. And then after supper, he took the the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pause for a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to take a moment as your as your church, as your people. And we want to thank you for what you have done for us. We say it here at Grace all the time, Christianity does not start with what we do. Christianity starts with what Jesus has done for us. And tonight, I pray, Lord, that we would maybe see that a little bit more profoundly, that it is because of your worthiness It is because of what you have done that makes us worthy. It's nothing that we've brought to the table. In fact, what we bring to the table is our shame and our nakedness. But Lord, when we come to the table, we leave differently because of what you've done for us. And and, and Lord, I, I, I just pray that right now, all of us here and those that'll watch by video, I just pray that we would take a moment and truly pause to realize that if it were not for your son Jesus, if it were not for him going to the cross, if it were not for his death, burial, and resurrection, we would not be able to have eternal life. We would still be lost in our sins. And I pray that as we do participate, 
means we've taken the elements, that we will see them differently from this point forward. I pray that in many ways our eyes will be open too to realize that it is your worthiness, it's what you've done for us that makes this possible. So Lord, we love you tonight. We, we rejoice. We thank you that you tasted the cup of bitterness so that we could taste the cup of joy. We thank you, Lord, that for, our, for us, you, you, although being rich, became poor so that we, through our poverty, might become rich. Lord, we just love you for that. We're grateful, and we thank you in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Well, we're going to let everybody go at this point. Um, we will hang around if you have any questions or you want to talk. I, I, I promise you, you want to be back here next weekend. We, we, we will continue to push this more. You'll continue to learn things more about the Bible. You'll learn to can see things differently. And uh, um, I just want to say to everybody, thanks for coming out on a Wednesday night. I hope this was something that benefited you. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Um, and uh, you know, Warren and I will be here if you would like to ask questions or talk or whatever. Um, but on your way out, please make sure that you get this. Uh, the the, the frontline team has these for you. Um, there's a lot more in here than what we talked about, but it's all about the Last Supper. And, and I promise you, you'll want to get this and read this and study this. this. This will be super beneficial to you. And every week, we'll do the same thing. We'll teach a little bit. You'll have this to go home with um, and to read. And, uh, you know, invite a friend, bring somebody next time. God, God bless everybody. Hope you have a wonderful um, rest of the week. And, and remember, as we say here at Grace, just because you got your church on on Wednesday night doesn't mean that you don't have to show up on Saturday or Sunday. So God, God, God bless everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Warren, thanks for being here. And we will see everybody very, very, very soon. Okay, God bless everybody.